Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. We are so happy to have you join us for this very important conversation. Also, thank you so much for your patience while we were straightening out a few technical issues. My name is Chandra Jesse. I'm a proud board member of Equality Now and the founder and president of INMAT, a foundation that works to challenge, disrupt, and eliminate systems of gender oppression. Before we begin, a few notes. So this is a webinar platform, not a Zoom meeting, so the controls are slightly different. Uh, if you would like to listen, we have translation into Spanish, French, and Arabic. So please click on the globe at the bottom of your screen and choose your preferred language. The format today will be about 20 minutes of conversation, followed by 15 minutes of question and answers. Um, we'd like this to be a very open, vibrant conversation. So please, also at the bottom of your screen, there is a function for Q&A. Please type your questions into that and we'll get to as many as possible. We are here today to talk about CEDAW, that is the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women their new general recommendation on trafficking in women and girls in the context of global migration. And we are very fortunate to have with us today, Dahlia Leonarte, who is a current member and former chair of CEDAL and also the chair of the committee of the working group on the general recommendation. So who better to help walk us through this general recommendation than the woman who led the process of developing it. In addition, she's a scholar who has won numerous awards, including the Fulbright, a prolific writer. She has written extensively on the lives of women in Soviet times, and also Apolitical named her as one of the 100 most influential people in gender policy around the world. We are also fortunate to have Tsitsi Madakare, who is Equality Now's global lead on sex ending sex trafficking. Now, if you found us online and you aren't familiar with the organization, Equality Now is an almost 30-year-old organization that uses the power of law to change the world and create equality for women and girls everywhere. It uses and works with grassroots groups internationally to hold governments responsible for achieving equal legal equality, ending sexual violence, ending sex trafficking, and also ending harmful practices such as FGM and child marriage. In addition to her work at Equality Now, Tsitsi has over 16 years experience of advocating for women's rights in Zimbabwe and the UK and is incredibly knowledgeable about the strategies and on the ground work necessary to achieve equality for women and girls. Thank you both so much for being here. And um, let's get right into it because I know we're a little pressed for time. So Dahlia, this general recommendation comes almost 40 years after the adoption of CEDAW, 20 years after the Palermo Protocol, so this is big. Um, would you be able to walk us through a little bit of the process of developing this general recommendation and kind of explain why now? Why is this general recommendation so needed now? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chandra, for introducing uh, me. And I really am very much grateful to Equality Now uh, for this opportunity uh, at least briefly to touch uh, the core stones of uh, general recommendation number 38 that has been adopted uh, last year. And, um, uh, and really, just to mention, uh, not going into very much uh, deeply in theoretical aspects of uh, trafficking in women and girls, just technically and just very obviously, it was clear that um, uh, Article 6 of CEDAW Convention, which, um, uh, which is defined like following, take all appropriate measures, including legislation, to suppress 
all forms of trafficking in women and the exploitation of prostitution of women. Just for those who are not so familiar with the CEDO Convention, I have to mention that CEDO Convention itself has 16 articles. And this article, sixth, so much important, is the most shortest one. It's just one sentence. And um, uh, since our convention was um, adopted in 1979, many issues uh, have not been covered at that time. And how CEDO committee uh, balancing the situation? This is why we are developing general recommendations. And so far, CEDO committee has developed 37 general recommendation on different articles of CEDO uh, convention. But I have to tell you that article six was left without general recommendation. This means that in all cases, uh, when we are having constructive dialogues with state parties, when we are discussing with civil society uh, on issues of trafficking in women and girls, we are left actually in the framework of, uh, you, uh, uh, in legal framework of CEDO only with this one sentence that I read before. So that is, was clear that it's not enough uh, for today. And um, that is why we um, uh, adopted um, in uh, 2018, the decision, the decision was adopted that is definitely the time for the CEDO committee to, um, to develop um, uh, general recommendation number 38 on trafficking in women uh, and girls. And uh, additionally, I have to, to say that it was stated that many regional and um, uh, international um, documents that are focused or related to trafficking in human beings, they, uh, we are lacking of gender dimension. And that was very clear during our talks with uh, state parties, because increasingly when the governments, uh, we are coming um, uh, back to, to Geneva or previously uh, to New York to talk with CEDO, uh, CEDO's expert on the issue, they, we are becoming increasingly formalistic. And the language was increasingly gender neutral. And actually, we noticed that um, despite of Palermo Protocol, actually, despite of some uh, uh, regional documents, uh, the language of all our state parties, 189, was very uh, similar to each other, which means the language, language um, uh, was um, gender neutral and the big issue became a huge impunity, meaning when we would ask uh, the governments how many perpetrators have you uh, punished or put in jail in the last five years, that would be just counted on one um, fingers of or one hand. So the issue was uh, meaning um, very obvious that we needed to make an elaborate document on how to combat uh, from the gender perspective trafficking in women and girls. Thank you so much. Um, and Sitsi, so we've just been hearing about how this was so gender neutral, how governments were not actually able to combat the real world. And since you're on the ground and working with so many groups, would you be able to give us some real world context on the trafficking in women and girls? Like a little basic on what is the scale? Are there any current emerging trends? And um, you know why this is so important? Yeah, um, yeah, thanks very much, Chandra. Um, so what, what, what we see is that uh, trafficking in women and girls is really a global problem. Um, and women and girls continue to be particularly affected by, by trafficking. Um, so the United Nations uh, Office on Drugs and Crimes um, every two years publishes a global report on trafficking in persons. And their last report was just issued last year which shows that for every 10 
victims uh, detected globally, about five are adult women and two are girls. So really we are looking at 70% of all trafficking uh, uh, or detected uh, uh, trafficked persons uh, being women and girls. And what we are also seeing over the years is increasingly that a number of girls um, are being trafficked. So reflecting a growing demand for younger and younger children that traffickers can control, uh, that they can exploit over a long period of time. Uh, so from this report from UNODC, it shows as well that 30% of all trafficked persons are children, and the majority of these will be girls. And the trafficking and exploitation of girls, especially adolescent girls, is an issue that the committee has acknowledged in the general recommendation, acknowledging particularly the additional vulnerabilities that girls experience uh, due to intersecting characteristics of, um, of sex and age, and how it's really important to ensure that we have age appropriate and child centered anti trafficking responses uh, where appropriate. At the same time, as we see that women and girls are the majority of trafficked persons, we also see that uh, most of them are trafficked for purposes of sexual exploitation. Uh, so 77% of women and 72% of, of girls. And again, we see that most uh, people that are investigated or arrested or prosecuted for trafficking offenses are predominantly male, uh, making up almost 60% um, of all people that are investigated or prosecuted for, for trafficking offenses. So I think what we really see is that uh, trafficking, trafficking is gendered, it is global, uh, predominantly affects women and girls, and trafficking for sexual exploitation remains uh, the most prevalent uh, form of uh, sexual exploitation. I think what we, be, what we are also beginning to see is the continual increase in the proportion of uh, people that are uh, trafficked within their own borders. Um, so I think this becomes an area that you know, we need to be looking at as well even as we think about trafficking across borders, but actually that there's a lot of trafficking uh, that happens internally. Um, in the last year or so with the COVID uh, pandemic, we've also seen um, increasing risk uh, for uh, around trafficking. Um, and an emerging trend has been that uh, traffickers are adjusting their business models and are beginning to use modern technology. So lots of trafficking or recruitment uh, happening uh, on the internet. Uh, but whilst at the same time, because of the impact of the COVID uh, pandemic, we see that uh, state authorities are not necessarily able to provide the services at the, at the, at the, at the rate that would be expected. Um, and we see as well that the pandemic is really brought to the forefront uh, just how systemic and deeply entrenched um, the inequalities are, which are also at the, at the root of uh, trafficking in, 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 in women and girls. Um, so globally, you know, we see it's still a challenge for women and girls, but at the same time, uh, worsened by um, some of the, um, you know, change in context, particularly within uh, the COVID crisis. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you and Dahlia have made it incredibly clear why this general resolution was needed. And Dahlia, um, I'd like to ask you a little about the foundations and how you how you created what sort of framework you relied on. Um, Paragraph nine of the resolution states that while trafficking is defined as a criminal offense in international law, states parties primary obligation is to address trafficking in a way that respects, protects and fulfills the human rights of persons, particularly of marginalized groups as set out in the core United Nations human rights treaties. And I think this is incredibly important that this is based on international human rights law. Would you be able to talk a little bit about, you know, what kind of legal frameworks your committee relied on and how you used international law to shape this? Yeah, thank you very much for, for your question. And first of all, I would like to stress that um, 
all principles of uh, general recommendation 38 and all powers that are included and developed in this document uh, is based on this one sentence that I mentioned in the beginning, meaning it's based on our CEDO convention. And since Article 6 um, makes this interrelation between trafficking in women and girls and exploitation of uh, prostitution, it became in our general recommendation absolutely inseparable. That is, that is uh, uh, undeniable fact. And uh, uh, there were some tries to, to, to divide Article 6, but that is exactly why the working group on, um, on, on drafting General Recommendation 38 that I uh, led uh, uh, last year and started in 2018, we refused uh, to do just because, as I said, CEDO is part of uh, a legal, uh, legal framework. It's an international instrument. And uh, our general recommendation was based on Article 6 and on two concepts that are inseparable. But it's not only CEDO convention. This link between uh, trafficking for women and girls and the sexual exploitation is based also on the convention of 1949 that uh, talks about um, uh, combating trafficking and abolitioning, abolitioning of uh, prostitution. Also, it, um, I, I, this link is established in, um, in documents of International Criminal Court, and also it is uh, established in, in Palermo Protocol, and also the link is established in um, in the reports of, of um, special rapporteurs for trafficking uh, uh, under the United Nations special procedures. So, so if to answer to your question why we first um, uh, established this link, it's, uh, it was based on our CEDO documents and on all regional and international uh, legal, uh, existing legal uh, frameworks. Then if to talk uh, how we strengthened the human rights approach in our, in our general recommendation 38, um, uh, of course, CEDO general recommendation is not the first document uh, that did it. We, we, we have other documents that um, establishes uh, uh, combating human rights um, for combating trafficking from human rights approach, but we, we are trying to uh, especially stress uh, the need of bring, bringing perpetrators to justice. It's part of human rights, just because when we are talking with victims of trafficking, um, uh, uh, female victims and girls, underage girls, what they want Number one is to bring perpetrators to, to the court, to the, to, the, to the room that they would be punished and they would be recognized as perpetrators. So it's a very much important uh, human rights approach, uh, which actually sometimes is missed in some documents when we are talking or start talking to generally. So, so this one. Another point is um, uh, remedies for victims. And we stress that it's not enough to recognize you as a victim and then to send you to, to a shelter somewhere. But it's very much important that the state parties would be responsible to, to provide you with adequate remedies. And the adequate remedies should be taken from perpetrators, not necessarily from state-established um, uh, 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 funds. It's a different thing for, for and I would stress in, uh, due to, to very short time, not talking that we, we established this human rights approach talking about uh, migrant women as victims of trafficking and asylum uh, seekers, female asylum seekers from the perspective of human, uh, of human rights uh, um, of human rights, but I would stress those two one. 
bringing perpetrators and really sub, um, uh, applying remedies uh, uh, for, for victims. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, because the general recommendation does have so much content in it, it's really important to highlight those particular things. And Tsitsi, given that, you know, these are the important um, items in the general recommendation, how useful and important are those from a civil society perspective that, you know, this general recommendation highlight the, the international rights framework, the legal framework, and the um, given that Equality Now operates in a legal framework as well? Yeah, I think it's I think it's really been important for the women's movement for uh, for the committee to have made that clarification and really, you know, sh showing that Article six is uh, indivisible that you can, you cannot separate uh, the trafficking from the sexual exploitation and looks at it as a as a whole um, article. And as the women's movement, this is something that we've been calling for clarification around. And so it's really, you know, like really key that the committee has also centered it uh, within international law and really uh, clarified that uh, for advocacy. And I think um, ha having that clarity then means um, governments can also then start to see what sort of uh, approaches, legal and policy approaches they need to be taking to ensure that that approach is uh, uh, implemented at the national level. And we would, you know, as Dalia was saying that this is really about accountability of, uh, of, of, of exploiters. And this is about protection uh, for women and for women and girls and ensuring that uh, trafficking doesn't okay in the first place. So I think, uh, you know, for us as Equality Now as, a, as an advocacy organization, we really see it as enabling us to center the need for the equality model, which looks precisely at the issues that Dalia has mentioned around you know, protection uh, for, for women and girls and ensuring that they are not criminalized, but that they are supported and, and, and enabled to exit. And at the same time, uh, calling for accountability of uh, the range of perpetrators um, you know, that are fueling the, 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 the sex trade or the sex industry. Um, so I think it, it provides a, a very clear framework for then taking forward a, a national advocacy, you know, that really then speaks to, to the need for gender equality and addressing uh, systemic and, and, and gender-based uh, discrimination that is leading to, to trafficking, yeah. Thank you. And I think this is a really important thing to stress because making the link between trafficking and sexual exploitation and prostitution so clearly where the, the committee states that state parties must take all appropriate measures, including legislation, to suppress all forms of traffic in women and exploitation of prostitution of women. And also that this is unequivocally a phenomenon rooted in structural sex-based discrimination constituting gender-based violence. And I think making that declaration that this is actually gender-based violence, like you were saying, clarifies and is incredibly strong and incredibly useful to um, to advocacy in the world. And so Dahlia, I know we won't have time to go through all of the recommendations that you are, um, you have in the GR, including upholding the rights of victims and survivors, ensuring gender sensitive court processes. There are absolutely a ton and I recommend everyone look at them for themselves. What do you, which do you feel are the most important or the most useful as far as, um, you know, having implementation of these recommendations? 
Okay, and uh, I just also would like to uh, just to come back to your very much uh, important point on exploitation of prostitution as the violence, and actually it was defined like this in General Recommendation 38. And if just for to, to encourage our <laughs> discussion that most probably we will have soon, I have to uh, to admit and remind you that uh, by adoption of this general recommendation 38, the committee unanimously we defined uh, a notion that prostitution is not a job. And that is why it is a violence, gender-based violence against women and girls. But of course, uh, CEDO members, uh, including especially I would say me, just because I'm working in this field uh, since night is in, in Eastern Europe, I understand that prostitution exists and it can be and is the last resort of women and girls. And that is why in our concluding observations, I do not remember any constructive dialogue with any state party that we wouldn't stress that women in prostitution should be protected. They cannot be criminalized or punished under any law, let it be administrative or uh, any other. So just because uh, it's, um, it's not uh, she who is responsible for, for being in, in prostitution. So what I am trying to say, it's not a, a, a novel thing actually, to say that the exploitation of prostitution is violence. It is already in our um, uh, concluding observations and recommendations back most probably 2013 and before when I already, even I joined the committee. It always was in the committee, in the committee thought. And, um, uh, your your next implementation implementation so we are trying to uh, uh, even though it's interrupted we didn't have any constructive dialogues with state parties already almost for two years uh, and it's online sessions but we have only with one with Denmark so we are trying to 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 talk and address Article 6, of course, uh, keeping in mind our general recommend recommendation 38. So this is CEDO's uh, uh, meaning task to convince state parties to adopt national um, legal frameworks in accordance to CEDO convention and general recommendations, uh, including ge general recommendation 38. But I have to tell you that other very much important international uh, instruments like OSCE, they already included the rec um, uh, recommendation for their 57 or 56 uh, countries, I do not know, the most uh, affluent countries of the world, to address the demand side, especially for sexual uh, uh, purposes, combating uh, human trafficking. So it's, it's not only CEDO now. It's already European Parliament, it's OSCE who, 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 who combat human trafficking in line with CEDO uh, General Recommendation 38. That is an implementation. Thank you, thank you so much. And Tsitsi, um, since you're working with groups on the ground, if you would be able to give us a little bit on the experiences of the women and girls that Equality Now's partners are working with, as well as talk about like now that we have these recommendations, kind of what are the opportunities and how can activists use them to protect and bring justice for survivors and those at risk of exploitation? Yeah, um, yeah, thank you. Um, I think I would start off by saying, you know, the, 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 the fact that trafficking and sexual exploitation is uh, gender-based violence, I think is something that plays out in every context where trafficking of women and girls is, is occurring. Um, if you just, you know, sort of look, start from the premise that when traffickers are recruiting or, you know, looking for people to exploit, um, they are preying on 
usually the most vulnerable and most marginalized amongst us. So, you know, it's women and girls who are young, uh, uh, affected by poverty, things like homelessness, um, low social economic class, uh, things like uh, caste and so on, or people that have already experienced uh, some sexual abuse and violence. Um, so I think when you sort of look at this is where traffickers are going, you would almost say wherever it is occurring, um, the most the most vulnerable and marginalized are being are being targeted uh, for for profit. Um, and you know, in some of the work that we've seen, so for instance, you can you, the, the women are being trafficked from um, Ed or state in Nigeria into Europe sex trade or you have young girls that are trafficked uh, within Kenya's coastal areas uh, to satisfy the sex tourism industry, or young girls in the Philippines who are being trafficked on the internet and sexual abuse, uh, uh, their sexual abuse being uh, live streamed on, on the internet, or you know, women being trafficked from um, uh, poorer countries in, in Europe to satisfy uh, the Western Europe sex industry, you know, so all of that I think just plays to the fact that uh, it's very much gender, this gender-based violence and so on. Um, I think what, what's um, important as well with the general recommendation is that it touches on a number of areas in terms of its uh, recommendations. And so areas around, you know, governments are needing to address demand, uh, governments needing to look at how the internet can be safer uh, for women and girls, um, issues around uh, uh, providing support and services to, to survivors and access to justice and so on. So I think there is a, a real opportunity at the national level for civil society to be, you know, sort of saying within our context, what are the priorities um, around all of those areas that the general recommendation talks about and how can we then, you know, work with or engage uh, or try and influence our, our government to be, to be looking at some of those um, areas where perhaps, you know, the implementa implementation is weaker, needs to be strengthened. Uh, what we've seen as well is that sometimes countries do have uh, trafficking legislation um, ad adopted in line with the Palermo Protocol and so on. Uh, but in terms of the implementation, you know, things like uh, service uh, provision or access to shelters, ensuring that uh, survivors have access to justice, there are so many limitations at the national level. And I think there's a real opportunity for civil society to be highlighting some of those inadequacies at the, at the, at the national level and bringing them to the attention of government to ensure that uh, those gaps are addressed. Um, the general recommendation as well talks about the need to increase awareness uh, within communities on, on, on trafficking and uh, uh, say sexual exploitation and so on. So again, I think there's a, an opportunity there for civil society to be um, engaged in some of the awareness raising or actually saying, you know, uh, government has a responsibility to ensure that uh, communities are aware of uh, sex trafficking, the legislation that's available and the remedies that are also available at the national level. Um, so I think, you know, we, whichever position an organization can be, whether they're a legal advocacy organization or community-based, I think there is a, a lot to take out uh, from the general recommendation in, in, terms, of uh, in terms of calling for uh, stronger responses um, at the national level. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yes, I think we can all agree on the importance of centering survivors, providing support and services, and most importantly, you know, not criminalizing survivors in any way. Um, so I think this is incredibly important in, in discussing the access to justice necessary. And we have we're running out of time and we have questions and I would like to get to a couple if we have time. We have a question from uh, someone with the Lebanese Council to Resist Violence Against Women that uh, asks, 
instead of committing to combat girls and women trafficking, some governments are themselves involved in these acts and facilitate it directly or indirectly, mainly through making it legitimate as part of entertaining tourism. What measures can we take as women organizations to stop these offensive criminal acts and reporting the governments themselves? Um, do either of you have, have thoughts, advice on this, this question? Dahlia? Dahlia? Oh. Yeah, uh, so uh, it's a very good question. Thank you very much. And if we had more time, I definitely would uh, have elaborated more uh, on this um, incredibly correct point. The governments are corrupted. If they were not, the trafficking uh, in human beings, uh, both um, um, male and, and female victims would have been reduced over those um, uh, decades, but they are corrupted. And they didn't mention um, uh, that um, in the process of adoption of our general recommendation, we had uh, um, uh, meetings, webinars, um, consultations with all regions uh, uh, globally. It was a very, very tense uh, time, very tense process. And for example, in Latin American countries, uh, we, we had um, our webinars regarding uh, general recommendation 38, the drafting, the drafting uh, uh, process. We had uh, our, um, uh, la this webinar lasted for five days. So, and almost all countries, they, they stress that the governments are corrupted. And that is why this and police um, uh, is also corrupted. My, my suggestion uh, from, from the level of CEDO, what we can do, um, my suggestion is that civil society uh, should submit to, to see though when their respective uh, national governments, they are preparing to have a constructive dialogues with CEDO, they should submit uh, so-called shadow reports on Article 6. And that is how we would address and we would push the governments in regards of um, of possible uh, corruption over combating, uh, uh, over combating uh, trafficking in women and girls. This is almost the only way how to make this link between CEDO's expert, civil society who knows the ground and pushing uh, uh, respective governments. It works very well, but the point is that I am in CEDO since 2013. Actually, never ever I had any session that sex work organizations wouldn't have present during our CEDO three times in a year, always. They are very well organized, they are strong, they, they are pushing us to help sex workers, women in prostitution, and we do it. But almost never we have a civil society who would um, uh, present the abolitionist point of view and in general who would let's say bring us on our table the corrupted uh, uh, governments and police in regards of uh, trafficking in women and girls. So what I am saying, civil society who has such uh, facts about corruption, they should let us know, see the committee know. Thank you. Thank you so much. Zizi? Yeah, I think I think she's uh, you know un answered it. So yeah, nothing to add. Really. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think she did. And I would love to ask a little more because we have more questions coming in. Because, And I know we're, we're out of time, but hopefully we can run over just a few minutes because of the technical difficulties at the beginning. Um, because this is so important to talk about this reluctance from some uh, vocal minority in the women's movement to target the demand. And Dahlia, I know that you, you talk about survivors and, and that what they want is for people to be held accountable for their exploitation. Um, 
So why do you think there is such a vocal minority opposing this? How do you think we can clarify this link and make it more obvious why we need to hold people accountable for this? And you're muted again, I think. Uh, keeping in mind the demand side, addressing the demand side, yes? So uh, first of all, I, I would like to stress that in General Recommendation 38, it's not the demand side uh, 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 when we uh, talking about uh, trafficking for sexual purposes, meaning not only clients at the demand side. We are talking, but it's not only them. We are talking about the demand side uh, for almost, not not all, but almost all forms of uh, trafficking. Uh, for example, uh, it was noticed that um, um, even countries with a very affluent and very good legislation on combating trafficking in some, some Western countries, they have to tell uh, you, they are ad already addressing the demand side for sexual purposes, but they do not address the demand side for uh, organ removals, even though they know that in, in their uh, countries, in Western European countries, mostly uh, the, these are aging societies. Many of them, they have this problem. And uh, as aging society and rich society, they, there is a huge demand for, for um, uh, meaning um, organs. So mostly, there is no such market that would cover all, all the demand for, for uh, officially obtained uh, 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 organs for donate for so so what what we have in many countries and, and we heard that um, uh, that the demand side is completely not uh, uh, the issue of the demand side for organ removal for uh, criminal organ removal is not addressed even though the clinics they know perfectly clear that they use uh, trafficked uh, organs or, and then if we are talking about organ removals in the in in poor countries in third world countries these are mostly actually women just because for traffickers in 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 those countries very often women are less literate or illiterate so traffickers they convince them that organ removed organ will grow up how should we say in english will grow up very very quickly and this is much easier um, uh, women and girls to to force to convince to talk in for organ removal just because they trust traffickers in the in this um, um, on this issue another point is uh, lack of um, uh, empowerment just because women and girls think that even if uh, they would sell kidney let's say she think that it's fine. She is less useful, useful for for uh, uh, for household or for family. So she could meaning uh, be like for for forsake her organ than her brother or, or father. So it's a very gender dimension talking about different forms of uh, um, uh, demand uh, side and the, necess the necessity of addressing demand side. It's not only sexual uh, clients as, as a demand side. Thank you so much for putting that in the broader context mm -hmm. of demand. Zizi, do you have anything you would like to add to that? Yeah, yeah, maybe it's the last bit of the question around, you know, what, what is it that we could be doing more of? Um, I, I think, you know, it's probably continuing to have conversations around, you know, in, 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 in really unpacking issues like cohesion and vulnerability and how that impacts on, uh, on trafficking. I think it's also, you know, maybe also sometimes positioning the issues in their historical context you know, how did, how did these issues emerge, uh, you know, making the links as well to race and um, 
colonialism, for instance, particularly when you're talking about uh, prostitution and, and, and trafficking for, for, uh, for sexual exploitation. Um, so I think you know there's there's room for us within the movement to continue to have those um, conversations so that we can come to you know points of understanding. I think yeah. Thank you both so much, and I feel like we could have an entire webinar just about this one issue, but unfortunately we are out of time. Um, if you have continuing questions, please feel free to email us at info at equalitynow.org and put CDAL webinar in the subject line and we will try to get back to you. We will be sending out a follow-up email um, with links, including a link to this recording. So please feel free to share it with um, coworkers, friends, just to broaden the discussion because we it is so important and we really would like to make this an open vibrant discussion continuing so thank you both thank you both for your conversation thank you all for joining us and have a great day